Okay, so today we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 3, and um, we are not going to read Nehemiah chapter 3, because if we did, everyone would be asleep. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I want to do is, I want to encourage you to read Nehemiah chapter 3 today, uh, this afternoon, but, you know, and Fred brought up a great point, you know, part of the challenge with the scriptures oftentimes is we, we read through them too fast. And um, or we take we take we take chapters like this. It's got a bunch of names in them, and it seems repetitive. And you're like, why is this here? Then you, so we skip and we just go to the next chapter. Um, but if if God didn't want us to study it, if there wasn't something in chapter three for us, then He would not have put it in the scriptures. So we got to slow down and, and look and see what's happening. So um, kind of as an as a as an overview. Um, Remember what has happened in chapter one. Nehemiah hears about the fact that the walls in Jerusalem are still down from his brothers who come back from a trip there. He's a cupbearer to the king, and his heart is broken over the state of the church, the state of the city, which would be Jerusalem, the country of Israel. Which, as an analogy for us, would be we are heartbroken over the state of the church. And he went four months of praying. And fasting, didn't fast for four months, but you can get the concept. Mourning and praying for what to do about that. And God basically said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to use you to do it. And then, so in chapter 2, he makes his presentation. It's his opening to the king. He prays. The king says, what do you want? He has a plan. He's already, and we'll talk about this today. We talked about it last week. We'll hit it again today a little bit. He had already prepared and planned. He knew, he knew what to do. So in four months, he wasn't just praying, he was praying and planning on how to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So then as we get to the end of <clears throat> the end of chapter two, he makes his pit, he gets there, he spends three days, not tell anybody why he's there really, um, but we know when he got there, he came in with the king's robes on, he came in with the, with the king's soldiers, he's got all this lumber to rebuild the gates. So they must know something's up and certainly he's got power um, and prestige. And so he, he, he spends three days looking at the place, figuring out, he gets his game plan together. He makes his pitch to the people. He says, we're a people of approach. Everybody looks at us as a joke, and they look at our God as a joke because our city hasn't been rebuilt. And by the way, the walls have been down for about 165 years. And 90 years they've been back there, and they rebuilt the temple uh, 40, no, uh, out of 96, 75 years ago, and they still haven't rebuilt the walls. And people have become complacent, right? And that's what happens in the church. We could become complacent. Well, there's lots of other things to do on Sunday morning. So we see our neighbors going and doing different things, and we're just complacent about where we are, I believe, as a church. So when we get to chapter, at the end of chapter two, he rallies the people. He says, let's rebuild. Come on, let's go. And they rally together and they do it. And then, so chapter three is basically just a layout of all the different people that are involved. So um, with that, I and mean, we'll hit some highlights in chapter 3, and we'll look at some individual verses, which will do some things for us. But I want to pull together, why is this here? What are we going to learn from this? And God made us as individuals, right? And salvation is an individual thing. But at the same time, he made us interdependent on one another. And that's why we are many members of one body, which is the church. The church is one made up of a bunch of individuals. And what God wants us to do is he wants us to work together for his kingdom. Because individually, we can't accomplish a lot for his kingdom. But collectively, we can. And he wants us to learn how to work together in unity and in harmony. And I think that's, the, that's really what this chapter is about. We have all kinds of people. So as you read through it, and, and as you read through it later today, underline or mark however you like to do it, um, the different titles of people. So what you'll see is it starts off in verse 1 with Eliashem, the, the chief priest, right? I mean, this is the head muckety-muck, the high priest of all the priests, right? And he's working. And then you go through and you see workers and individuals and merchants and goldsmiths and perfumers and women and all kinds of there when you when you go through, if you take each one of those and you kind of mark them down, you look and you go, man, it covers every bit of society. It covers rich people, poor people, prominent people, non-prominent people, laborers, all kinds of things that stepped up. And what's cool is you don't ever see anybody described as a carpenter or a stonemason. 
That doesn't mean there weren't some there, but you don't see them described. And I think the reason being is because we would assume there'd be some of those people there. But what I believe God is showing us in Nehemiah is that everybody stepped up and did something, even though it was outside of A, their comfort zone, or B, their spiritual gift. So God has given all of us spiritual gifts, and we need to use those for kingdom things. But there are times when we just have to do work, right? And it's not a spiritual gift work. It's just work. Yeah, we have to come together. So why did God put Nehemiah 3 in, 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 in the scriptures? Um, it's not just a dull recital of a bunch of names. In fact, what it does is it preserves a heroic story about people who came together from all walks of life, right? The highs and the lows. Everybody came together for one thing. To do what? They played their part in bringing glory to God by rebuilding his, his city. Um, everything with God is about structure. We've talked about this. You know, God is God of order. And so when we look at, especially when we study the scriptures, we look, there is an order to things. And it's very interesting that there is an order to how the wall is, is, is rebuilt. And look at verse 1. It says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, arose with his brother, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Hmm, interesting. They consecrated the hundred doors, they consecrated the tower, but they built the sheep gate. So what's the first thing that's done that's brought up in that? Is the sheep gate, and so they're going to start the sheep gate, and probably most of you in the back of your Bibles will have a, a map or a, 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 an aerial look, drawing of what the city looked like. The city was, so when you look at that, you start the sheep gate, we're going to see as you read through chapter 3, it moves counterclockwise, around the city as it rebuilds all of the different aspects of it. And the sheep gate is most important. Why? Because that's where they bring in the animals for the sacrifices in the temple. So if you look at it from a structure perspective, they didn't start the dumb gate or the refuse gate where they take all the trash out. They started the most important gate, which is where people come in to bring their sacrifices for their sins. And so here's the breakdown of everything that was done. Ten gates, four towers. There's actually order to the to the chapter. Verses 1 through 5 describe rebuilding the north wall. Verses 6 through 12, the west wall. Verses 13 and 14, the south wall. And verses 17 and 27, the southeast wall. So what's cool is if you look in verse 1, it starts at the sheep gate. And there's going counterclockwise, two and a half miles around. And you go to verse 32, and it ties back into the sheep gate. So the whole thing is structured and ordered. So what does God want us to learn from it? I believe he wants us to show us the importance of working together for God's purpose. Or another way to put it is God's work done God's way. And that's really important as a church because we can come up with all kinds of things to do and, and missions to try to accomplish. But if we try to do it our way versus God's way, we're going to ultimately become very frustrated with it. And so God wants to teach us his way to do work, and he wants us to conform to it. So to accomplish his purpose, which is what we should be all about as a church, we need to do three things, which I think we clearly see here in the scriptures. We need a common vision. In other words, we, need, we all need to be in agreement, per se, of, of what the vision is. We need dedicated leaders. We have to have leadership in order to move forward with anything. And then we also have to have workers that are willing to do their part. And these three elements um, are, are, are there clearly in this, in this chapter here, whether they're explicit or implicit, implied, um, they're there. So let's look at them one at a time. To accomplish God's purpose, number one, we need a common vision. And so um, the, it's interesting when you think about it, how did this come together? Nehemiah came up with a vision, and here would be the common vision you would need. So let's say that Dave and I, Dave, Dave and I live next door to each other and we're called to work. Well, if he builds a decorative fence and I build a fortress, it's not going to, see, there's no unity there. So we had to come together, right? And Dave says, well, I was thinking a really nice decorative fence. And, you know, I look at it and I go, Dave, that's great, but how's that going to keep our enemies out? Oh, okay. So we come together with a common vision. We need to build the wall in a certain way. They need to agree to the vision in order to work together. So if we don't, as a church, agree with the vision and the direction of the church, then how can we ever do the work to accomplish it in harmony with each other? We can't. 
So this task was very specific and very measurable. Rebuild the wall around Jerusalem to provide a defense against God's enemies. And so as a church, what is our common vision? Well, our common vision, number one, is the Great Commission, which is to go, therefore, and tell, right? But it's also, most importantly, maybe even more importantly than the Great Commission, because the Great Commission is wrapped into this, is that our common vision is to bring glory to God in all that we do. Everything we do on our campus uh, is about bringing glory to God. And whether that's a gathering uh, on a Wednesday night for a meal, that's why one of the things as a vision, as a leadership that we try to do is we never want to come together in any aspect without breaking open God's Word, whether that's for five minutes or five hours. Because, yes, yeah, great, we need to build relationships, which we do within times like meals together, but we also need to be breaking open God's Word anytime we're doing those things, and that should be our goal. Our vision is to always bring God glory in all that we do on our campus, individually and collectively. So everything we do for the Lord should have that vision in mind. In other words, if we look at any ministry, Hey, we're thinking about starting this ministry, or we're thinking about supporting such and such ministry. The question then becomes, does that dovetail into our vision of bringing glory to God? If it does, then we want to be part of it. If it doesn't, then we don't want to be part of it. So uh, that's why when we look at a chapter like chapter 3, we see that there, were, there was no unimportant job. And so when we think about you've got to kind of break it down and, again, read it in color. We all know, even if you've never built a block wall, you all know that it takes lots of different elements, right? You've got to have stones, or we would call concrete blocks. You've got to have stones. You've got to have water to mix the mud with. You've got to have concrete to, 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 to mix with the water to do. Right? You're going to have to have scaffolding. You're going to have to have ladders. You're going to have to have shovels. You're going to have to have all of these things. Well, not everybody had all of those things. But if we come together for one vision, then we can work towards how we will accomplish our goal. So secondly, we need, so we have to have a vision, which we got. Then secondly, we have to have dedicated leaders who can help everyone towards that common vision. And that's what we saw at the end of chapter 2 with Nehemiah. It's interesting. Everybody knows the walls are down. For 90 years they've been, that these people have been, so all of the folks that are now living with Nehemiah is living. Ezra's been there for 13, 14 years. He never got caught this great vision to rebuild the wall. Now, he was more of pushing more towards understanding God's word, but he was looking around. He knew the wall. He knew he was in reproach over the wall not being built. So how come it never occurred to him? Because God didn't allow it to at the time. And Nehemiah came up with a vision. The people listened to Nehemiah as he brought forth, and remember, where did Nehemiah get the vision? It wasn't Nehemiah's vision. It was God's vision that he put on Nehemiah. And so where's a great application for us? Are our hearts pliable? Are we seeking where God wants us to serve? Because remember, we talked about Nehemiah's job as a cupbearer to the king was a, I mean, other than the fact that you could potentially die at any time you drink something or eat something to test it for the king, that little pressure there. But otherwise, it's a great job. I mean, he lives in the king's palace. And so he has everything that he needs, and he leaves there to go to this beat-up old city to rebuild it. And so when we look at that, the vision that God set before him came through what? Came through months of, or let me back up, came from a burden that God put on his heart. So are we praying that we have a burden, God puts a burden on our heart, because that's when we do something about it, when God burdens our heart. So God burdened his heart, he prayed, he planned during his praying, God opened up the opportunity, and, he, and as soon as he did, he jumped right in and went to move it. So what I think we're going to see here in, in Nehemiah chapter 3 is Nehemiah's leadership, and it breaks down, and what I want us to show today, I think, is seven things that Nehemiah shows us that good leaders do. Seven things good leaders do through Nehemiah. First of all, number one, a leader must not mind if the credit goes to others. Doesn't mind if the credit goes to others. Nehemiah wasn't looking to have a big giant plaque put up that said the Nehemiah wall or anything. He wanted the wall to be built. Why? So God's name could be exalted. Go back to chapter one. Why was he heartbroken? Because he knew that with the, his brother told him, brother and the other guys that had been there with him on this journey, said the people are in reproach. 
Why? Because the wall wasn't built. Well, he knew that was then, again, when the city is destroyed, then everybody looks around. The pagans look around and go, well, if you're God so great, then how come your wall's destroyed? How come his, this mount, this city that's supposed to be God's city isn't in, uh, is in ruins? And so he didn't care about it. What he wanted to do, and that's why when you read through chapter 3, there is a, there is a reference in, in verse 16 about Nehemiah, but it's a different Nehemiah. It's the son of Asbuk. So there's no, there's no glory in there's Nehemiah, and he writes, remember, he's writing this in first person and third person, kind of flips back and forth. He doesn't say, well, yeah, man, I got all these guys together. The first thing I did was I got the priests over here to do this, and then I got the merchants over here. It wasn't about I. I. There's no I in chapter 3. So the glory went to everybody else. Why do we know that? Because God wrote these people's names down in the book to do that. In fact, if you go to... A turn in Nehemiah to chapter 13, the very last verse of the book of Nehemiah. And look what his prayer is. And this is a lot of years later. Go there real quick. The very last thing. Um, remember me, my God, with favor. Remember me, my God, with favor. That was it. In other words, it's very similar to well done, good and faithful servant. Or is that why do we labor? We labor so that one day we stand before the king and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So we see as a leader, that was all what Nehemiah was out. Nehemiah wasn't about, Lord, bring glory to me through this. Let the light shine on me. Let people say, whoa, Nehemiah, what a great leader he was. No, he just says, Lord, look on me with favor. In other words, I, I spent a lot of time doing a lot of things and and remember back to Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. Remember, he never, well, he doesn't never. He doesn't use the I word, he uses we. He says, why is Jerusalem in, is still destroyed? Because of the sins of me and my father. And when he talks to the people in chapter 3, or chapter 2, he says, our sins, we need, we are a people of reproach. Let's say you are people. He says, we are a people of reproach. So he joins in. So he was humble in that. So he was laboring for well done. Second, um, second thing that a good leader does is a good leader motivates people. And look, 90 years the Jews hadn't been built, hadn't built the wall. Um, and they ended up ultimately, remember, they're going to build it in record time, even though we're going to look at chapters 4 through 7. They have a lot of problems come against them, but they end up building the thing in less than two months. So they really rallied together to get it done. Motivation is the key to productivity. And so when he said, let us, he'd say, hey, y'all need to rebuild the wall. He said, let us rebuild the wall, and I got a plan on how to do it. And, you know, he must have been effective from that when they saw him, because when he came riding into town, he's got all the lumber with him from the king's forest to rebuild all the gates. The difficult thing about motivating people is that what motivates some turns others off. And so you've got to find the balance there. Interesting. Look at, um, look at verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Moreover, next to him the Tekoites made repairs. Watch this. But their nobles did not support the work. Hmm. Interesting. In other words, he motivated a lot of people, but he didn't. And, and Tekoa, by the way, is a, is a little town in Judah. So it's, it'd be like saying, uh, we're doing the work in Geneva, and these are some folks over from Mims. All right, so they're Israelites, right? They're Jews. Not remember, not everybody lives in Jerusalem, and we'll see that in the chapter. You got people from all, all bunch of different towns, and they but they came together to rally in to make this thing done. So the, the um, he assigned them to do a work, and isn't interesting. The nobles from from Tekoa didn't participate in the work, but the people of Tekoa did. In fact, they actually built rebuilt two sections of them. Um, the priests worked on the sheep gate, we saw that. Others repaired the wall in front of their own homes. In verses 10, verses 23, verses 28, 29, and 30, you see people, look. so how did he motivate people, right? Hey, um, wouldn't you like your, think, again, think of it in color. If you live there and your house is there by the wall and the wall is down, that would be dangerous for your kids to play around because they could be attacked. And we're going to see they literally were being attacked, physically being attacked. And they were, if you go to Ezra chapter 4, when they tried to rebuild the wall the first time, 
They were being attacked. So what do you do? He said, listen, hey, don't worry about what's going on the other side of the city. You rebuild the wall in front of your place. That's the motivation. And it's interesting because what would that do? Well, some of it is somewhat, I would call it peer pressure, because you don't want to look around and everybody else's section is built, right? And then you look, everybody looks at the section in front of your house and goes, oh, the Harrisons aren't very motivated. They haven't even done their wall yet, right? So there's peer pressure um, that comes when you see others stepping up and doing things. And if peer pressure is, there's nothing wrong with peer pressure. It just shows, you know, you see somebody who's doing something, serving the Lord, and you go, wow, I want to be a part of that. I want to, I want to have some of that. So they had a personal incentive to do a good job. So again, you say, why all these names? Why all these details? If you slow down and read it, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times where it talks about people rebuilding the temple, the wall, in front of their own house. Interesting. And it's, isn't that cool? Because when you think about the high priest, what's a high priest all about? He's all about doing the sacrifices. you got to bring the sacrifices in. So what's he want? He wants the sheep gate built. So that's what he did. That was his That was his gig. Thirdly, a leader must plan and organize. What we saw in chapter 1 and 2 is that as he prayed, we know he planned during that four months. Remember chapter 1? So chapter 1-1 one, one, and chapter 2-1 is a four-month time change. And we know that he prayed during that time, but he also planned. And the reason we know that is because when the king says to him in, in the beginning of chapter 2, hey man, why the long face? He says, well, because of what's happening in Jerusalem, I want to rebuild the walls. And immediately, the what did um, Artaxerxes say? He said, that's, I'm paraphrasing, that's a great idea. What do you need? And he immediately starts tearing off. I need letters for the governors of the provinces so I can go through, okay, I need a letter to the king's forest keeper so I can go and get all the timber that I need for the stuff. So you see, as he prayed, he planned. And that's something that a leader has to plan and has to organize. And so what he did was he organized this two and a half miles worth of wall rebuilding. And what all he did was he broke it down into manageable chunks. Hey, you guys work on the place in front of your, hey, priest, you guys, sheep gates over here by the temple. You got to have the sheep gate done. Y'all work over on this area. And then you know what? As we read through this, you're going to see that there are other people that came, like the, the people from Tekoa, from these other cities and towns. And you know what? You can see them as they kind of walked in. They came up, and let's say Nehemiah's got two or three guys that are out there delegating where to go. And they just came walking in and said, hey, man, we're from over 50 miles down the road. Where do you want us to work? And so what would they do? As they were planning and organizing, they'd look around. Oh, you know what? Over here, um, we got we don't have enough people over here in this section. Can you go work on that? There are four towers to be built. Can you go work on that tower? So people just came in and volunteered and knew what they said. And again, it's implied. You can't read this anywhere, but clearly it's implied. When they walked in, they said, hey, man, we're here to help. Tell us what you need. They didn't walk in and say, well, I'll only do this type of work. I'll only do that type of work. No, no, no. They said, where do you need me to work? And we think about that from our perspective, right? doesn't matter whether it's VBS coming up. We got some work projects to go on around the church that are going to be coming up here this spring and summer. And the idea behind that for us is you come in and say, hey, man, where do you want me to go? I've got skills in this area, but I'll do whatever you want me to do and whatever you need me to do. He assigned available workers to various units, and he worked them to coordinate for everything to fit together. And you got to think about it. It's got to be organized, right? Because if I'm building a wall over here, and you're building a wall over there, if we're not organized and set, I don't know if you can see this in 3D, our walls may come together and not click, right? <laughs> they got to come together like this. they got to hit. But if they come together wrong, because we weren't planning and organized. And so you see, not only did you have people physically laying block, you had people out surveying, lining things up, make sure it worked. They have 10 gates to rebuild, and these are massive, massive gates. Well, guess what? You got to build the columns, and they got to be poured columns. I guess they poured columns back then, I don't know, um, to be able to hang these gates and do that. And so you probably actually had stonemasons and carpenters, guys that knew what they were doing, and what, were, what would they be doing? You plan and organize, I pull all my carpenters together, and I pull my stonemasons together. There's not enough of them to rebuild the entire wall. So the people have to do it. So somebody like Nehemiah, as a leader who's organized the place, will look and say, okay, you two carpenters come here. Y'all are going to be in charge of helping all the people with the carpentry work in this section over here. We're going to grab two more stone mixes. You guys are going to be in charge of helping people learn how to lay block over in this area. So delegating 
And, and organizing is very important. And, and the reason that it's important to do that is because you prioritize what seems like a daunting task. And when we look at it, we look at the, from the revival. If, 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 there were just, if there were just three elders or four elders trying to do the whole revival, it wouldn't have worked. So what happened was we took a big task, we broke it into manageable chunks. So we make sure that the priorities are in order. So the application for us is, what is our priority? Individually, right, putting God first in all areas of our lives and then making sure that we're putting God first in all areas of our ministries. Fourthly, a leader has to delegate, and we see that. He couldn't have done all the work by himself. And so, again, if you just slow down and think about it, you got all these, not all these, a lot of unskilled people trying to rebuild something. How are they going to do it? Well, somebody was delegating to them to help them get the work done, right? And, you, you know, you think about it. You've got some people over there trying to work on hanging a gate, a massive gate. They can't figure it out. They're going to somehow is going to get back to Nehemiah and say, hey, man, we, we got, we're unskilled over here at this gate. And then Nehemiah is going to reach out and say, okay, I need some of you, two of you carpenters to go over there to make that work. Just kind of put it together in your brain. Fifthly, a leader must oversee. Um, while he delegated work, it's interesting. He also knew what was going on because he knew all the names of the people and what they were doing. But here's cool. Let's go to verse 20, chapter 3. It says, after him, Barak, Baruch, Baruch, the son of somebody, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the doorway to the house of Eliashib, the high priest. So look at that. In other words, we know, we know that, um, we know that he oversaw things because here, look, he's calling out one guy and says, this guy zealously repaired. In other words, he saw it. Tells us he wasn't just sitting back in his office. He wasn't in the air-conditioned job trailer, you know, saying, bring me a report. He's out amongst the people he's working. He says, man, look at this guy. He is zealously doing things for the, for the kingdom. Um, the balance between delegation and encouragement, I think we see that there because he's encouraging them by that. And then six, a leader must give proper recognition. Um, isn't it interesting? He, he writes down in detail um, some things like the people from Tekoa that actually built two sections, right? Um, and there are several folks who built two sections. In verse 4 and 21 and 5 and 27, you see the same people building multiple sections. Maybe they were just really good at it. Maybe they were just really highly motivated at it. And sometimes it's a situation like that. Maybe what they did was they they they. They split the responsibilities up. And we're going to see that. We'll see a lot more of this detail in the coming chapters in 4 through 7 as they do things like when, when the enemies were coming against them, one person stood with a spear while the other person used the tools to build. And then they would switch positions when they did that. The important thing was that Nehemiah, Nehemiah recognized every worker and God recognized every worker by including their names and so what we want to do is we want to do the same thing. We, you know, it's not about the recognition of man. It's the recognition of God that will come when we do his, his work his way. And then here's, a, here's the seventh um, thing that a good leader has to do. Uh, and, and I believe it's pointed out clearly. Is that a leader must not get distracted by those who are not cooperative. Not get distracted. So... Back to verse 5. And we read this earlier, but I want to spend a little time on it. It says, it says in verse 5, it says, um, Next to him, the men of Tekoa made repairs, but their nobles did not support the work of the master, didn't support the work of Nehemiah. Um, and you know what's interesting is, we could have, Nehemiah could have gone south right there. How dare you not do this? You know, and I got to put a delegation. We got to go talk to these nobles. You know what he did? At, at least the way I view it, is it? He just ignored them. He just ignored them. Um, to the noble shame, by the way, their people stepped up and built two sections of wall. That's in verse 9 and verse 12. Look at, look at verse 9. He says, next to them, um, the son of somebody, the official of half the district of Jerusalem. Oops, not not. I must have gotten the wrong verse there. Hang on. Anyway, if you go through there, there are twice where the people of Tekoa are called out to do that. I wrote the verses down wrong. Uh, Nehemiah didn't expend a bunch of energy on these nobles from Tekoa that weren't interested. So what did he do? 
he concentrated on those people that were willing to do the work. All right, so listen, you're, you're not catching the vision. You're not part of this. That's okay. But been mad, didn't condemn them, didn't say, you know, you're, you're, you know, throw them out, of, throw them out or anything. He just, just moved around. And here's the application for that. And if you're going to be involved in any ministry, which you should be, um, is that um, you're never going to have 100% cooperation from everybody. I mean, it's just it's just reality, and I think the scripture bears that out. Not everybody is always going to be on board. Now, I didn't say the nobles created a problem. It just says they weren't willing to do any work. But I mean, who knows? Maybe they were just too prideful. Maybe they thought, wait a minute, I'm a noble in my little town, and so you know I don't do manual labor. And I, again, this is my view. I mean, my little town said, cool, you don't have to. Nobody, you don't want to. I'm not. You know, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time and try. To, Twist your arm and make you feel guilty about it. Just whatever. I'm going to spend all of my energy on those people that are willing to work. And so, from an application, I think from a church perspective, is you know, if you have people that aren't willing to grow, that aren't willing to study, that aren't willing to participate, that aren't willing to help, I mean, we, we want to encourage them to do so, but ultimately, we well, can't bad. We don't want we don't want people to do things for the kingdom in our church. Unless they want to, no sense of guilting people. In it. Much easier to work with those that want that were willing workers. Um, so the question for us is, what are we doing individually to build the kingdom, and what are we doing individually to bring unity? Uh, there's a great book. It's a Christian book, and, and and the premise behind it is that either you are a peacemaker which is someone who strives for unity. You're a peace breaker, which is someone who busts up unity, or you're a peace faker. In other words, you're not really doing either one, which is kind of like what Jesus said, you know, you're neither hot or cold, right? You're sitting on the fence, either be a peacemaker for unity. And really, if you're not a peacemaker, then you're probably a peace faker or you're a peace breaker. You're not, you're not, you're not bringing that to it. To accomplish his purpose, we need that common vision. We need leadership, right? We have to have leadership within the local church. Um, and we also have to have leadership, not just within the local church from our elder perspective, but we have to have leadership in individual ministries. We can't lead every ministry. We can't be part. We can't do every ministry. That's why we have people that are heading up VBS. That's why we, we have ladies that have stepped up that, that are doing the, the ladies' ministry, right? That's not, that's not a leadership perspective, from an elder doing that, this leadership perspective, from somebody has felt the burden on their heart to lead a ministry, and therefore, as as leadership, what we ought to do is encourage that and um, delegate it, let them go, let them work, let them do their thing. So, lastly, um, to accomplish God's purpose, we need willing workers, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about. What are willing workers? The people heard Nehemiah's response. Go back to chapter 2, verses 16, 17, and 18. He said, let us, let, let us rebuild the wall. We, we need to do this. And look at what the people, how they responded. Isn't it interesting? I kind of look at it like, <clears throat> you ever have one of those projects, uh, maybe at the house, and you've just been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off, and you keep looking at it, you know it's there, it's got to be done, and, 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 and you've been procrastinate and then all of a sudden one day it just gets under your skin you go I'm going to get this finished and you get motivated and it gets done and typically at least in my experience I get it done a whole lot faster than I thought I was ever going to um, but you've been looking at it for a long time and I think that's what this is everybody took a piece of the wall if you break down chapter 3 there's 41 different work groups that are referenced to do this 41 so when you think about leadership from Nehemiah's perspective, it clearly shows he had to have a group of people that he had underneath him that were taking over because no person can manage 41 groups of workers doing it. Um, and what it shows us is there's always room for workers. That's what's so cool. So when you read this chapter later today, think about it. And, and for me, I underline the different names. And, and who were the workers here? And they're, they're listed by occupation. Priests, temple servants, rulers, nobles, common people, men from faraway cities and towns. That'd be verses 2 and 7, um, where other cities are referenced. So if you go to verse 2, 
It says, next and then the men of Jericho built. Hmm, Jericho. That's, that's like Jericho is in the walls came tumbling down Jericho. Um, and then if you go to verse 7, next to them, uh, the men of Gibeon and the men of Mizpah. Again, those are other cities, right? And what were they there? They were there doing it. And so again, think about it. If they're there working and they live in Jericho, which is not next door, right? It's, it's a ways down the road. So think about the other things that had to transpire. They had to have a place to stay in Jerusalem. Right? Maybe they pitched a tent somewhere. Maybe, I, I believe, that what you had is you had the people that lived in, in Jerusalem were then opening their doors up. So when the men of Tekoa or the people of Tekoa came to work, they said, okay, hey man, you can work right here and, and we, you can stay here and we'll have these neighbors bring in food. And you see unity. So when we look at just the names that are written and the occupations, which will continue, there were gatekeepers, there were guards, there were farmers. There were what I call union men, the goldsmiths and the perfumers. There were merchants. There were women. So everybody came together, and but everybody had to come together in multiple ways. So it wasn't just workers because you got people from out of town. So you see, it, it, was, it was the entire population that was involved in this. So you may, not, you may have been very, very active in the building of the wall of Jerusalem and never touched a stone, never touched a board, never touched a tool. Because maybe all you were doing was back making meals or providing the provisions that were needed to take around. Somebody had to make provisions and take them to all the different people. So you see, it took everybody. And it takes everybody, and it ties right into what Paul talks about in Corinthians, about the body being you know, one, and he uses the analogy of the physical body. Um, so let's look at four, um, four, four aspects of willing workers that we glean out of this. The workers were willing to cooperate and co coordinate with one another because of the overall cause. So there may have been some that didn't feel like doing it. I don't really think that's, you know, we've been here all these years. You know, things are okay. Couldn't it be better? Yeah, if the wall was built, they could be better. But you know what? It's really not that big a deal. But yet they came together <clears throat> while some worked in front of their other, in their own homes. Others came from outlying cities. But when, and think about it. So you got people that come from another city. They build the wall and they leave. They don't, what real benefit did they get out of it? The benefit was the glory that it brought to God. Not that it protected them because they had their own city that they had to live and work in. So beyond the personal benefits, they were willing to work for the overall cause. And, and what was the overall cause? That the name of the Lord and his people would no longer be a reproach among the nations. Go back to go back to the burden. Nehemiah's burden was the people were a reproach. It wasn't bringing glory to God that his city wasn't built. It was taking glory away from God. So um, they also coordinated projects so they fit together, like we talked about. Each person knew what their task was, as we would say in today's language. Everybody kind of stayed in their own lane, right? Um, it wouldn't have worked. As we talked about, if one person built his section where it wasn't going to tie in with the other people's sections. So they had to cooperate and work together. Um, in the church, it's the same thing. It's not a much to have a bunch of independent ministries alongside one another. We should all work together supporting the overall cause. That's why as we go through our, our, our teaching and also um, the preaching from the pulpit, you know, this year, this theme is revival. And we're going to continue to hit on that. Why? Because we got a bunch of independent ministries, but we want them to come together. We want the church to be re our church to be revived, which means individuals need to be revived. Next week we're going to well, we'll talk about next week. Next week. Um, <laughs> secondly, the workers were willing to complement one another for the overall cause. In other words, everybody couldn't do the same job, and there were probably lots of jobs um, that were not very glamorous within this, but they were willing to do it. Each worker saw how important it was to do their job, no matter how small. And that's what we want to look at as we serve the Lord here at our church, is there is no job that's small. There is no job that's too, that's too big. We, we come together and we all accomplish individually. If we are in harmony with where the vision is, then I believe God will do great things in our church. Amen. And when I say great things, I don't necessarily mean growing the church in numbers, although I think that will happen. But what's more important is that we grow foundationally 
so that all of our, we are, we are doing our best job to equip people that they're putting down firm roots so that when the complications and the tragedies of life come along, that we're able to weather through those and we're able to grow spiritually. And as we grow spiritually, then our focus will become more and more on the kingdom and bringing glory to God. And as we bring glory to God, I believe He will open up the floodgates of His blessing upon us. And His, ble his blessing, His way, as we do His work, His way. So one of the things we have to do as a church, and that's why it was so important leading up to the revival, was all the prayer. Because if we're not in prayer about it, we tend to drift and want to do things the way we think they ought to be done, which may or may not be within God's will. And if we're not within His will, then he, He's not going to give the blessing to us um, that He will. And again, that blessing is not a, it, it's not a blessing of anything sometimes that the world would call glorious, but it's a blessing of what He would call glorious. I know it was for me when I was able to stand outside that tent and look back and see all the people and see what was going on and watch people come forward and watch people get baptized. And, and we're still seeing the impacts, or, or, I hope you are, of, of that revival as we, saw, um, as we saw last week with um, Rob and Corey right, coming through that revival, coming to the Lord and rededicating to the Lord and wanting to get right with baptism. we got somebody else who wants to get right with baptism, not because they're not saved, clearly they are, but through that message that came out of Tommy Green on baptism, we have a person who's come forward, another person, we've had more than one who's come forward and said, you know what, I was baptized as a kid, and then I got saved. I, I need to do this scripturally right. So we're still seeing the impacts of that coming through for us. So, um, thirdly, some workers were willing, uh, working, were willing to get outside their areas of strength. And we see it even in verse 1. Look at verse 1 again. Then Elisha, the high priest, arose with his brothers and the priests and built the sheep gate. So here we are. These are priests, right? These are, the, these are descendants uh, of Aaron, right? They're the Levites. And, and if you want to see the difference, it, a, a cool contrast is go to the Gospels and look at, the, at all the descriptions of the Pharisees and the high priests and all that. No way, no way those guys would have gotten out and rebuilt that gate. I, I, I don't see it. They were too above it. They were too many rules by then. If you look at it, they were all about, right? G, and Jesus called them identifiers. They wouldn't get near the tax collectors. They wouldn't get near the people that were unclean. Well, guess what? Elisha, he got near people that were unclean to rebuild this wall and to rebuild the sheep gate. And so we see that, and, and that's the comparison that I look at. So I look at the Pharisees and the high priests from the New Testament, um, the Gospels, and clearly I don't believe that they would have uh, gotten their hands dirty doing those types of things. Um, your spiritual gift, as I talked about, is important, and we need, to, we need to seek out where our spiritual gifts, what they are, and how God wants to use them, but don't confuse a spiritual gift with kingdom work that needs to be done, because there are plenty of things outside of your spiritual gift that need to be done that God would call us to do, and we're called to pitch in, and we're called to help in all those areas. The point of Nehemiah 3 is that everybody got involved, and that's the big deal. Everybody got involved. Um, the New Testament is clear that if you're a Christian, then you're in ministry, which means and ministry is service, by the way. That's all that means. Ministry is service. Um, and more importantly, you're going to have to give a talent. If you go to Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents, I mean, what does parable of talents mean? Is it means that God has entrusted, right? Do you remember, do you remember the parable? Let's, in fact, let's read it. We have time? No, not really, but we will. Matthew 25. Parable of talents. That's probably too long to read. Um, but what does it say? What it says is, is that the master left his different people went there and left one guy with four, four talents, he went and made four more talents. Left another guy with two talents, he, he brought two more talents in. And then he got the one guy, gave one talent, he buried it. And everybody, when the master got back, everybody had to give an account of what they did with the talents. It doesn't have anything to do with cash, but anything to do with money. 
What it has to do with is if you're a Christian, then you're in ministry. You have a service to provide. And what the parable of talents means is that we're going to give an account for it. And the account is, do you want to have, you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Or do you want to hear, I mean, that's really all you did? All the, all the, all the, all the talents I gave you, no pun intended, right? All the spiritual gifts I gave you and you squandered them away. I, I mean, that's what this is about. Everybody got involved. And so everybody needs to be involved in ministry. Some workers, lastly, were willing to do less glamorous and desirable jobs. Look at verse 14. This guy, I call him Mal. What did he do? He stepped up and he repaired um, the refuse gate. And he built and hung his doors. Sometimes, some translations is called the dung gate. Nope. I mean, there is a fun intended there because that's the real, that's the real deal. In other words, it that's that opened up to the Kidron Valley, which is where they put their trash out. Um, and so when you look at that, you know, that was that was the least glamorous gate to build. But you know what? Somebody stepped up and got it done. And that was why it was so interesting when you look at these individuals. Everybody did something. And Nehemiah recognized, or God recognized, those that stood up. That's why I think this chapter is so important. Not only did everybody get involved, Everybody got involved where it was, where the work was needed, not necessarily where they wanted to work. So in conclusion, we'll close with this. If you know Christ, if you are a believer, then you are a vital part of the body. There is no one, no believer in our church that is not a vital, integral part of this body. At some point, the Lord wants you to get involved with the cause of the kingdom through the various ministries of this church as laid out in the vision, which is our vision, loving God, loving people, right? Serving. I mean, that's what it's about. So, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says this. We'll close with this. As each one has received a special gift. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Each one. So if you're a believer, then you have received a special gift. Employ it. In serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So what are you supposed to do with the spiritual gift that you receive? Number one, how do you employ it? And it's a simple verse to break down. How do you employ it? By serving one another. That's the first job. Say, okay, I'm a believer. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to serve other people. Primary job. Um, uh, why the, uh, good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, God gave you grace. You give grace to others by serving them. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. But now, wait, the bars get ratcheted up. Whoever speaks, right, and this is the one who has received a special gift, when you speak, do it as you are speaking the utterance of God. In other words, let your language, let your, let your talk, right, be filled with godly things, things of the kingdom, things of God. It's not that it's, un, it's not allowed to talk about things that aren't about God, but eventually, it ought to come back to that, as you do. Whoever serves, well, who's supposed to serve? I think according to what we read in Nehemiah 3, everyone's supposed to serve. So here's what First Peter says. Whoever serves is to do it as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So say, you know what? I'm no good at that. That's cool. God's, God is. He'll give you the strength to do it. Or he'll bring somebody alongside you who has the skill and ability to do it. And again, I take that and I just use that simple verse and I pull it in to chapter 3. And then you look and you say, because there are plenty of people stood there and said, I got no skills to build a wall. And you know, I said, that's cool, I got it. Don't worry about that. I'm going to put somebody alongside you who can. Or, again, I'm inferring here. Or he said, I don't need you to build the wall. I need you to make meals. Mm, okay. Or I, I need you to coordinate with somebody. Or, you know what, they're having trouble over down by the east wall because Tobiah and, and the Ammonites are coming in against them. I need you to go stand down there with a sword. Okay, whatever, whatever's necessary. Or, you know what, I need you to put up the workers from Tekoa at your house. That's all of these things. So whoever serves, served by the strength of God. Why? Here's the big, and that's the, in verse, verse 11, why? So that all things so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I think as you read Nehemiah chapter 3, they embody 
everything, the people, except for the nobles of Tekoa, embody everything of 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. So in my Bible, Nehemiah chapter 3, I wrote a note that said 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. These people lived out what Peter talked about. And that's our challenge for us, is that we'll live out what Peter talks about as well. Amen? Amen.